Hello and welcome back to Continental Club where we discuss the hottest topics in European football. I'm afraid we're not in the East Dulwich Tavern today. I'm afraid for the first time in a little while we are unable to film in person this week because Mikey's housemate has tested positive for COVID unfortunately. Get well soon Mikey's housemate. So my cubs, you're, yeah, we're trying to play it safe. We're, we're filming remotely. How are you doing? How is it in the COVID household? Yeah, it's not too bad, thanks. Not too bad. Just, you know, the usual protocols, uh, you know, um, letting letting each other know when we're in the kitchen, etc. those kind of things. Just trying to avoid all human contact. Um, but yeah, not too bad, Duke's not too bad. We've kind of, yeah, we've been here kind of before. I feel like everyone's yeah. been here, haven't they, by this point? It's Absolutely. been two years, it's getting a bit boring now. But um, but yeah, not too bad, Duke's. So far, I'm, uh, I think I'm safe. Cat of nine lives is Mikey McCubbs. Henry, how are you doing on this Thursday afternoon? <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Um, I'm okay, thanks. This is always a highlight of my week going to East Dulwich Tavern uh, to film Continental Club, so I'm quite sad that hasn't happened. But hey, what can you do? We're resilient. Here we are still. Uh, back on back on Zoom. you love to see it. So yeah, no, I'm good, thank you. How are you, Diggy? I'm okay. I'm a little bit embarrassed. My fantasy, my, not my fantasy football team, my actual football team got beaten 22 last night. Jeez. 20 goals to oh my two. Goodness. Uh, yeah, I'd never really been involved in anything like it in any sport. <laughs> it, was, it was horrendous, really. Uh, I mean, we, we kind of had a good time and by the end they were kind of laughing at us. We were laughing at ourselves, but they were, they were top of the league, we're near the bottom and we didn't have our full strength side out and we just got absolutely torn apart. It was a pretty miserable experience, but yeah, shout out Zach Jalab's team who got their first win in was, about six months this week as well. So, yeah, Doogie, as one person on Football Daily's football team goes up, one goes down. Doogie, was yeah, there not well, a mo- was there not a moment where you just put bodies behind the wall and stop trying to concede? Because surely, surely well, we, there's a point where it's just getting. Yeah, we set off with a, a three-one formation, and I played centre back, and we're, yeah, we we are very bad. Um, all over the pitch really and they were very good footballers so we were going ultra defensive from the get-go then they went about it was six nil at half time and we thought you know if we get the next goal maybe we'll make it a little bit respectable but then they just the superior fitness record (laughs) fitness levels just really told in the second half and, and it just got really really ugly anyway speaking of more beautiful things less less ugly thrashings today we'll talk about the perfect replacements for your club superstar this was sort of, I suppose, inspired by the fact that Liverpool seem to have brought in, well, they definitely brought in Luis Diaz, but with the idea seemingly to replace Sadio Mane, either in the short or long term. So this got us thinking, you know, there are numerous superstars all around Europe, and while there are some quite obvious potential replacements in the case of, I don't know, Karim Benzema and Kylian Mbappe, there are some other ones that seem a little bit undecided about who could potentially replace who. So we're going to kick off with Robert Lewandowski and who could potentially replace him. This comes in from Jagan 3 and Henry, they've, well, Jagan has suggested Erling Haaland. I mean, that would be the perfect replacement for Robert Lewandowski, surely, but whoever comes in here, enormous shoes to fill, to put it to put it mildly. Absolutely, but of that, of anyone out there, Lewandowski's, um, sorry, Haaland's probably in the best place to sort of try and at least hit the goal record that we've seen from the great Polish striker. In recent times he's scored at least 40 goals in all competitions in the last six seasons and he's on 34 in 27 so far this year that's just crazy isn't it and I actually think we saw Haaland come out and say that Lewandowski was his player of the year in 2021 recently and he said uh, Messi and Benzema were tied second or third so that kind of shows you the respect that Lewandowski sort of garners from arguably his greatest striking opponent in the Bundesliga uh, doesn't he and if we look at Lewandowski's contract first he's got about one year remaining on his deal uh, there was noises that he wanted to move last year I, I could maybe believe it fancying a different challenge um, but but it looks like his contract probably won't be extended um, at the conclusion of its current cycle uh, and if he goes then you know why not go for someone like Holland? I think it would be quite difficult I'm not sure that Bayern Munich really sort of play ball in that kind of financial world of um certainly the wages that, that Haaland is going to be asking for and I think all the various fees that are going to be involved in that deal because although um, you know the 60 million 60 million euro transfer fee for him is going to be quite modest it's it's going to be fairly bloated once everything else is taken into consideration I mean but yeah I, 
listen, Holland's, Holland's numbers have been great. 80 goals, 21 assists and 79 Bundesliga games for Dortmund. That is just beyond anything we possibly could have imagined when he signed uh, from Salzburg, isn't it? 4.6 shots per 90. He's just an absolute animal. Doesn't actually doesn't actually touch the ball a whole lot during the game, does he? But when, when you release him on that final shoulder... When you get him in behind the defender or find in the box, you can guarantee something's going to happen. It's, um, he, it's, he's almost been a cheat code for this Dortmund side. And it's just a pity they haven't really been able to capitalise on his time there and maybe push on a bit harder, push a bit higher up in the league. Obviously, this year, their team has been wildly sort of beaten up a little bit of injuries, etc. There's been a lot of makeshift formations. We haven't even seen Gio Reyna and people like that for a while. And it's no surprise maybe that they want him to stay for another year. It sounds like they're willing to pay him £20 million euros or pounds to do to do so just so they can at least try and put together a proper squad under Marco Rosa and give them the best opportunity to push on even you know the success of Jude Bellingham etc and other players in the squad but I do think he'll leave whether or not he'll go to Dortmund uh, to Bayern I'd be I'd be amazed and it would be that'd be like a classic Vlavic to Juventus situation that Dortmund's to Bayern Munich transfer mm. I'm not sure how well that would go down I think he would like it uh, I know that Mino Raiola has name checked Bayern as the kind of club that um, his client could go to, but I think some personally, I think someone like Patrick Schick is a bit more of a realistic target and, and an achievable target, which would fit in with uh, Bayern Munich's kind of policy and strategy. And considering his success in the Bundesliga since first going on loan to Leipzig and now bossing it by Leverkusen, what was it? We were just looking at 18 goals and 17 appearances in the Bully this term. He looks like a great, great proposition, still young too. So I maybe look, I think Patrick Schick's more realistic, but yeah, sure, why not Holland if given the opportunity? I think so. I mean, if, if they're given the opportunity, it would slightly go against their previous transfer policy of not spending, you know, enormous, enormous fees, uh, which Holland will be when you include, you know, the agent's fees, his wages, etc. There's probably going to be clauses about winning Ballon d'Ors, etc. in there as well. Like, Holland has the potential to probably earn more money outside of Bayern Munich. But if he could go, if Bayern Munich could persuade him to stay there, obviously that's, you know, the sort of signing that probably guarantees them you know, another five, six years of dominance at the very least. So it'd be a really exciting move for Bayern if they could get it done. And Dortmund seem like they want their his future sort of tied down fairly soon. They're supposedly willing to offer him £20 million per season to stay, but ESPN claim he could earn up to £30 million per season uh, at other clubs, which could include Man City, Real Madrid, of course. I'm sure Man United will probably try, but I don't think he'll, they'll be top of his list either. I mean, McCubbs... Henry name checks Patrick Schick there. Do you think that's much more realistic for Bayern? And do you think that they should potentially, you know, ditch the idea of signing Holland and really start thinking realistically? Um, yeah, I, th- I think he's obviously a more realistic um, option. Um, I don't know. I think I think it is worth checking out Holland. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity, really. Um, if you're thinking about getting someone in who can who can almost instantly replace the output of Robert Lewandowski. I think he's, you know, he is the man, isn't he? Um, you know, in terms of his build-up play and things like, he's not at Lewandowski's level. But in terms of his movement in the box, in terms of his ability to just complete, completely bulldoze defenses, he's, you know, he's pretty much the best around. So I think, I think it, if Bayern Munich do have the funds available, then I think Holland is. Um, you know, Holland is definitely someone that they should be looking at in that in that sense because he can kind of guarantee them another ten years of Bundesliga dominance almost, and um, you know, will make their chances in in Europe far bigger as well. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think. I've just been trying to rack my brains of, of of other strikers who they could go for. I guess someone like Alexander Isak, who's obviously been a target for Arsenal, would be a shout. His goal scoring record this season hasn't been great, but he was superb last season. Um, and again, is one of those very dynamic kind of strikers who's you know physically very imposing, but also technically um, you know has a huge amount of potential. Um, obviously, former Dortmund man as well. Didn't do so well in the Bundesliga there, but you know was was quite unfortunate with injuries, etc. So, um, so yeah, I think there there are a number of number nines out there who are kind of more realistic options for Bayern, but there is quite a big gap between them and Holland. I think. Mm. I think there's no one. You know, when you're yeah, when you're talking about a Lewandowski replacement, it, it's hard to like envisage um, any of those players doing so. They they may well be able to get up to speed, and you know, we know Julian Nagelsmann is a brilliant attacking coach. So um, so yeah, but in terms of yeah, a guarantee, then um, then yeah, it's, it's yeah, very uh, 
it's very rare to find someone who could who could replace someone like Lewandowski. Absolutely. It felt like even someone like Flavic, a mm. Juve, is that a guarantee? We're not so sure just yet. Is Isak, was he a guarantee to smash it in the Premier League at his age? Probably not a guarantee at least. Hurling, Erling Haaland even, uh, is an absolute guarantee to, to Van goals wherever he is. He's an absolute man mountain. Let's move on to Luka Modric because as I mentioned at the top of the show, Karim Benzema, if they sign Kylian Mbappe, whether he's going to play wide for a couple of years while Benzema winds down his career, that feels like an obvious sort of ready-made replacement there. But Modric is the more interesting one. And um, M. Khan 2004, McCub, suggested Jude Bellingham. Hmm. But I think it's worth, before we start talking about Jude Bellingham, just to give some credit to Luka Modric, who has been phenomenal this season once again. Yeah, I mean, Modric has been pretty phenomenal for the last 10 years now, isn't it? Like, I mean, it was, yeah, it was, it's nearly 10 years since he signed for Real Madrid. Um, he's played at least 40 games in eight of his nine full seasons at the Bernabeu. Um, and I think that's something that, that perhaps gets discounted a little bit, is just how good his, his fitness record has been. Um, he ranks eighth in the squad for minutes this season. Um, only Casemiro has started more games among among the midfielders there. He's got a goal and four assists. So yeah, his, his output is still great. His defensive work is still very good. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he's going to go down as an all-time... Well, he already has gone down, hasn't he, as an all-time great. Um, so, again... Do you again, think on that point, do you think... Sorry, McCubbs to interrupt. Do you think he will be, you know, considered when he retires in the same breath as, you know, your Iniesta's, your Xavi's, your, your Paul Scholes's, I don't know, those those really top, you know, yeah. rare, rare midfielders mm. in world football? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. I think even when he was at Tottenham, he was, you know, he he was considered a kind of uh, the kind of next step of what a playmaker could be in terms of um, someone who could kind of do it all really you, you know he's obviously plays a very deep line role when he when he plays for Croatia but is also able you know to do a uh, play box to box he's never really been a classic number 10 but that's kind of you know he has the kind of he has that kind of skill set and for that reason I think yeah he is a near defining player and also I think I think it's easy to look at this Real Madrid team and see, you know, some of the the seasons where they've not been so good. But like ultimately, this the Real Madrid team of the 2010s is one of the greatest Real Madrid teams ever, arguably one of the greatest football teams ever. Um, and Rodrich has been arguably the most consistent performer, like a lot across that time, um, aside mm. from Ronaldo before he left. So, um, so yeah, he he has to go down as that, and obviously that makes you know, like with Lewandowski, it makes the the task of replacing him um, a lot harder. Um, having said that, I think the one thing Real do have in their favour is that Casemiro, uh, you know, is is isn't getting any worse right now. Neither is Kroos, although he's um, 32. So I guess you know, in the next couple of years, we could start to see a decline with him. So whoever is coming in, you know, will still have quite a good support base around him. Um, and obviously, they've already got Camavinga through the door. Obviously, Valverde. Um, has really impressed, although he hasn't played as much this season. Um, you know, I think there's a yeah, there's a bit more of a uh, th there'll be a lot of um, room to, to grow in the, in that midfield, um, especially when when the attack is doing so much work as well. Um, but yeah, Jude Bellingham would be an amazing pickup for them. I mean, he's yeah, him and Pedri, I think, still are the the two outstanding kind of teenage midfield talents in Europe. Obviously, Camavinga, mm. you could kind of put in there as well although it's you know I guess it's slightly disappointing we haven't seen uh, as much as we would have liked to of him so far this term um, but yeah Bellingham is again one of those players who can kind of do it all in midfield uh, you know he's not just a defensive powerhouse he's you know superb at progressing play he's a bit of a leader as well he can organize the players around him which at such a young age is is a really you know promising um, aspect of his play um, so yeah, he would be great. Um, I know there were shouts of Paul Pogba as well. I think as, in terms of a short-term fix, he would probably be pretty good. Um, you know, he's crying out to, to play in a system where where he's able to express himself more. And I think Real Madrid could provide that with the kind of stability that you get with with players like Casemiro and Kroos. So um, he would definitely be a short-term fix for sure. But I think yeah, Bellingham would be would be great I think it's just a case of whether Madrid will be able to get him because I think every every big club in Europe is going to be going in for him but equally I do think that 
you know, th- there's always a temptation to think where, where you know, with, with English players who have gone gone abroad, that they will always want to return to England at some point. But yeah. I don't know. Like Bellingham went to Dortmund at 16. Like that's that's the sign of a player who's hugely ambitious. Um, and I think you know the experience he'll have had there. I think he, you know, I think in terms of where he could go next, I think he'll be quite open-minded. Um, and Real Madrid in two years' time could be, you know, a very different beast to what we're seeing now. You know, Mbappe at the moment looks like he's going to go there, right? And imagine if Haaland went there as well. You know, we could be talking about a team which is once again at the pinnacle of European football. So yeah, I think Real Madrid could be in a very good position for Bellingham to join in a couple of years' time. You know, financially they've been run pretty sound over the last couple of years, haven't they? I think they I think they've posted like a one million euro profit um, in 2021 um, in terms of transfers and, and you know and other things um, and obviously the new stadium which obviously has saddled them with some debt but once that's completely up and running the extra revenue from that I think will be um, you know will, will be really beneficial so um, yeah I, th- I think they're going to be you know even you know even without you know winning Champions Leagues every year and winning La Liga every year they're obviously still a you know, pretty much the number one kind of um, or number one most attractive club in Europe for for players to join. Um, so in two years' time, it might be a no-brainer. Could well be. What an exciting prospect! I get what you mean about it, the fact he might not have any sort of guarantee that he's going to come back to England at any stage. Really, I mean, he's talented enough to play for any team in the world. Maybe he just enjoys you know, the the stage, the sort of lack of maybe a bit less publicity than he'd probably have in England, like the less intrusion that he'd have into his personal life. But I am so, so excited about Jude Bellingham. I think he's going to cost £100 million plus, but probably in 2023 or maybe even 2024. I mean, he's got age so on his side that there's no real rush. But I was trying to think when you were, when you were talking, and I was trying to think of midfielders that I remember sort of bursting onto the scene in the same way that Bellingham has. And the only one that really springs to mind is probably Steven Gerrard mm. um, in like the early 2000s. And the fact that he could kind of do it all in the same way Bellingham can, really high work rate, surprisingly quick as well, surprisingly strong, can score goals, can create goals, like can play a deeper role as well. Like there doesn't seem to be any limits to Bellingham's game at this moment. So it is an incredibly exciting time. Um, and if he has half the career that Steven Gerrard has, He's going to be very, very lucky indeed. But <laughs> at the moment, he looks like he is uh, on track to be an absolute legend of the English game. And I hope I'm not going too over the top there. I just really am rating Jude Bellingham so far this season and last as well. Henry, <laughs> let's move on to a big question. This is a, a big one. I'm intrigued to see where you go with this. But Arthur of Arnav suggests that Anthony would be a good, a good replacement for Mo Salah going into the future. It's a pretty thankless task to look to try and, try and replace Mo Salah right now, but could Anthony be the sort of player that Liverpool would maybe look at, maybe in the maybe in twenty twenty three, maybe in twenty twenty four? I actually love this suggestion. I think it's great. Um, obviously, if you, it's kind of in the mould of Luis Diaz, moving there as potential sort of long term replacement for Mane, etc. But Anthony, he's he's really stepped it up. Nineteen goals, seventeen assists in sixty eight games. For Ajax, that's 0.5 goal contributions a match. That's pretty superb for him. And actually scored an unbelievable goal. Well, not unbelievable, but a great goal for Brazil the other night. Um, who they romped against Paraguay. That Brazilian side, that's without Neymar. They're destroying teams. When when Neymar comes back, it's actually very scary. If you look at the amount of talent mm. running through that. I was speaking to my Brazilian friend this week. And he's absolutely buzzing. Especially with Coutinho back in the fold as well. So yeah, and Anthony could be a big part of that um, Brazil side when they go to Qatar and I, as we all remember I tipped them for the final perhaps but yeah uh, Mo Salah 23 goals 9 assists and 26 games this season he's he's basically dragging Egypt through the AFCON obviously we don't know if they'll have been in the final by the time this goes out but he, he's, he, he is obviously irreplaceable but there is still a big debate about what kind of contract they should hand him how long they should give it to him for uh, we've seen clubs do it before they've handed a legend uh, basically a retirement contract as it were it's never quite worked out, although I do think on this occasion they should be keeping Mo Salah around. I mean, 2.1 key passes, 1.9 dribbles. It's, it's, we hear these numbers said about by other players, but he's, this guy is really converting that into goals and sort of assists. And just every, every week he's doing something which I think is lighting up the pitch at Anfield. And he's been superb. Uh, you know, 
there is a suggestion that maybe Harvey Elliott could, could be like some kind of long term successor but I don't think he quite plays um, as far forward as, as Mo Salah uh, it was interesting they were linked with Fabio Carvalho he's perhaps a little bit more further forward lying than Elliott um, but I know they're probably going to pick him up in the summer no matter how little I like that move <laughs> from a tears Fulham, for Fulham mm. tears for Fulham exactly but yeah um, Anthony why not I think this is exactly the kind of transfer they would uh, they would go for probably probably get him for quite good money as well um, he, he he's really exciting I think he's in this next great Eric Ten Hag side I think he, he was a superb pick up I remember when he moved there a few seasons ago and everyone everyone sort of raise an eyebrow at it but he's really stepped up to the to the plate and even in the Champions League as well this season two goals and four assists 6.1 shot creating actions per 90 that is bonkers that's like you know dribbles live passes dead passes sort of fouls that are all leading to efforts on target uh, he, he's an absolute menace for that Ajax side which obviously a lot of us are pitching to go quite far into the competition this term um, so that's definitely something to look out for Will this, season, will this transfer happen this summer? I don't think so. Maybe next year? Sure, why not? I think this is exactly... Liverpool aren't idiots in the market. They spend wisely, I think, Dukes. You did a good tweet about that the other day. They, they they go in for targets who they know they can... Who aren't quite the finished product, but they know they can get something better out of. So, yeah, I think Anthony is an excellent shout uh, in this. But uh, Adi Amy as well, potentially. I think we're going to talk about him later. But, yeah, um, why not Anthony? Why not? I'd love to see it. A great Brazilian back in the Premier League, you, you know, always, always a good look. Absolutely, no, it'd be, uh, it'd be brilliant. He's an absolute box office player. I was listening to a podcast the other day on the back of PSV versus Ajax, which Ajax won one nil through that Masrawi goal that me and my Cubs talked about on ERU that week. And this journalist was saying uh, he was being asked why are Ajax, you know, why have they not pulled ahead in the Eredivisie? Why have they struggled to break down? these sort of more defensive teams in the Eredivisie. And he said, well, it doesn't really know. It doesn't really know. They score so many goals in most of their games. They've got a phenomenal defensive record. But he thinks some of their players probably, you know, wait to play their best football on the Champions League stage and really step up in that occasion. And he said Anthony was one of those players. So maybe he needs to show more consistency and level of performance across all his league games as well. But I think it really bodes well that he, you know, is excited by the Champions League, loves the loves the stage, and is able to deliver on it at this age as well. So Anthony definitely one to watch in terms of Mo Salah's potential replacement in a couple of years' time. But I'm sure Liverpool fans will be hoping that day is a long way away yet. Let's move on to KDB. Now, Oli two five two nine eight suggested Florian Verts, and initially I thought. Oli, you've lost your head. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Florian Vert's more of a forward, KDB more of a midfielder now. But then I got to think of it, you know, at his age, KDB was a winger, really. Yeah. And, and I don't think he was as productive as Florian Vert's is at the moment. He's been absolutely sensational so far this year. Eight goals and 12 assists in 23 league and Champions League games. I put the question out there on Twitter yesterday and actually quite rightly probably got put down saying, you know, has he now surpassed... Havertz's impact in a single season at Bayer Leverkusen or has his general level of performance succeeded or superseded where Havertz was when he left Bayer Leverkusen and people quite rightly pointed out no Havertz did it for two and a half years I think but Florian Wirtz is the sort of player that I can see really working well under Pep Guardiola like his time on the ball his awareness the way he picks out passes so nicely the fact that he can beat a man quite easily before releasing a shot as well the, the timing of his shots as well. He often shoots in between people's legs when keepers <laughs> least expect it. Like, he's just one step ahead and he's 18. And he just seems like a really, really special player. And he's already working slightly harder than KDB, which bodes which bodes well, despite the fact Man City probably seen more possession. So maybe this isn't quite fair. But yeah, KDB's at about 20 pressures per game. Florian Verts is about 22. And, and Verts is already offering 0.32 expected assists per 90, which is not far off De Bruyne's 0.35. And I know De Bruyne, up until the last couple of months, had a slow start to the season. Everyone was saying, oh, is this the start of the wind down? Now he's 30. The amount of football he's played over the last few years for Belgium and club level as well. But obviously you responded in spectacular fashion over the Christmas period, De Bruyne, and was absolutely excellent in that. And I'm sure he'll have a really strong end of the year as well. So I'm not you know, writing off KDB whatsoever. And I think by the time he retires, he'll probably be one of the outstanding midfielders. Don't know whether you want to recall really him a midfielder, attacking midfielder that the Premier League's ever seen in terms of raw technical yeah. ability, trophies, the works. 
So Florian Verts, massive shoes to fill, but I would be, I would, I would be really, really intrigued to see him in a Pep Guardiola 4-3-3 playing on the right hand side or the left hand side because he is left footed. Um, but yeah, they do also have Cole Palmer. They've got Phil Foden as well, who are coming through. They've got James McAtee, who's just signed a new deal. I think they're giving Bernardo Silva an extension. So Man City are already preparing as they always do. They're such a smartly run club so intelligently run and they'll be preparing for the future all the time but guys let me know in the comments do you think Florian Verts is good enough to replace KDB in the future not quite yet he is only 18. Uh, let's quickly do a few more then uh, Skriniar was the one I put on Twitter and people came back with Sven Botman uh, this was linebreaker underscore one I mean the Cubs it feels like if Skriniar doesn't leave there will definitely be interest in, in one of Inter's mm. centre backs this summer because they have been phenomenal for so long now yeah, for sure. I think I think if City weren't so well stacked at centre back now, I think Bastoni would be a player yes. top of their list, wouldn't he? Um, on that on that left side, um, yeah, it, it feels it feels kind of inevitable that, that one of them will leave. But equally, they've managed to keep them together for so long now. Um, you know, it, it could be another one or two years. Obviously, Skriniar has yeah only one year remaining on his contract. Liverpool apparently monitoring the situation. Um, so yeah, there's there's obviously a possibility that that people come in for him this summer, but apparently he's keen to stay. Um, so you know, like like many players that entered the last few years, actually, you know, there's been quite a loyalty to the club, um, which has really worked in their favour in terms of being able to sustain kind of title challenges over the last three years. Um, but yeah, Sven Botman, I think as well, you know, is is going to be in high demand this summer. I think um, Newcastle obviously tried to go for him and didn't happen but he's definitely going to leave isn't he um, I think his, he and his agent have said as much I think Lille have have admitted defeat on that on that part and they'll you know end up making what a 35 40 million euro profit on him at least um, so again another another master stroke by the Lille recruitment team um, the only thing is in terms of Skriniar he's uh, left-footed Skriniar obviously plays on the right um, so I don't know whether that would be you know, he'd be a like for like replacement, but he, I think he, you know, the, the, that inter back line would be one of the more ideal places, I think, for a player like Botman to develop his game because obviously it's a back three. You can, you know, slightly rely on the more experienced players around you. Um, but, you know, he's already proven himself to be a very, very good ball player. Obviously, physically, he has, you know, pretty much all the attributes already. He's excellent in the air. Um, so yeah, I think going to a club like Inter would be would be really good for Botman. Whether he's like yeah that that like luck for like replacement with Skriniar, they'd probably have to do a bit of um, rejigging in that back line. But um, but yeah, I think I think he'd be a pretty good shout. Diggy, Diggy, okay. yes. Can I can I just caveat this for a second? Because uh, I'm pretty Go confident. On. I'll put money on Matthias Ginter going to Inter, as it were. Yeah. This so and I think. For a free transfer, which is what it's going to be, because it's already been mm. confirmed that he's going to leave Gladbach uh, this summer. I think Inter will definitely be looking at Ginter, who's actually one of the most consistent defenders in the Bundesliga. He's got about 70 caps of Germany, so he's a really solid defender. Still quite young as well, only about mid-20s. I think line breakers suggestion of Botman will probably be for AC Milan to replace Kier as like a long-term, like as a bit of a switch-up. I mm. think, obviously, Milan were looking at him this January uh, can get a deal over the line and may perhaps saving their pennies for a summer move so I think that might be a more likely proposition if Ginter is going to go yeah. go to uh, into Milan this I think this, the, uh, I think the problem is as well is that Botman's going to cost a lot isn't he and Inter yeah. are not spending a lot of money at the moment so in that sense yeah Ginter is 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 a pretty good good guy to get through the door for free um, yeah but um but yeah there's been yeah, there's been talk of that for a little while. The Ginter Onana double free transfer in the summer, hell <laughs> of a couple of deals. That that's really really exciting. Mm. Uh, people were so kind sending their suggestions in on Twitter, so I want to do these really fast before we move on to a bumper big match predictions. I kind of want to you know just general initial thoughts. We don't have to go into too much depth. Henry Ibrahimovic, do you think Alexander Isak or Jonathan David could be good enough to replace Ibra? That was at the suggestion of Aaron the Pokemon. What um, a name. Do you agree with his suggestion? Uh, I I think on the national stage, Isak's been brilliant for Sweden, and I do think he's a very good striker. I don't think he's quite ready, perhaps, to replace uh, Ibrahimovic. I I've, I'm just a huge fan of Jonathan Davis. I just I really think I 
think he's excellent. I think he's superb. I think he was scoring goals over in Belgium. The most expensive departure out of the Belgian league, which is no mean feat at this point in his career. Yeah, why not? 15 goals in 28 league and UCL games this term. He's not quite the same as, as Ibrahimovic, but I think he's got a bit of speed to him. He's, he's been brilliant for Canada, who are really on the comeback trail at the moment. I think I think Jonathan David, if Canada do go to the World Cup and then are going to host the World Cup along with USA in the next few years, I think Jonathan David is about to be one of the real stars of world football. I really do. I think he's, he's perfectly placed. I think he's perfectly placed to hit that as long as he makes the right next move because so far it's been excellent. So yeah, for me, Jonathan David is the one. And if we just... The next one, uh, the Suarez replacement, I think another striker who I'm a huge fan of and we've been talking about a while on this channel. I love from at uh, NMB Nicholas, Darwin Nunez. Uh, we looked at, mm. we saw West Ham looking at trying to buy him um, uh, this winter, sort of a late 50 million bid. A lot of these stri strikers could fill various roles. I think Nunez could be another one that Bayern Munich look at as a Lewandowski replacement, in all honesty. I think he's got that kind of gravitas up front. He's a big guy. Obviously, Suarez is on the way out of Atletico Madrid. I'd be amazed if he doesn't uh, stick around after this summer only 30 goals well only 30 goals 30 goals 5 assists in 67 games for the club him along with that David Villa pick up when they run the, won the league originally this is it was this has been such a smart signing for them and yeah I, I can see Nunes going to Atletico and sort of tearing it up there 34 goals 14 assists and 69 games for, uh, for Benfica bear in mind he started pretty slowly he didn't go, it took him a while to get going over there but since yeah. he has he's been amazing and you know he was the most expensive player I think ever to leave La Liga dos when they bought him from Almeria and everyone said well you know, this is a big gamble spend 20 million euros on a Liga dos player and he, he's gone and shown exactly what all the fuss is about and yeah another guy who I think we're going to be talking about for many years to come yeah it'll be intriguing I think that the only thing about him going to Atletico Madrid maybe it's a bit pathetic because you know they're obviously different players play different positions but the Jao Felix deal hasn't really probably worked out as Atleti wanted. Would they be that prepared to spend big money on someone from Portugal? Maybe that's a bit naive, but I think in these build rooms, maybe it would be a factor, who knows. Uh, a name that I always see being linked with PSG McCubs to replace Mbappe is Richarlison, and John Manfield wanted us to talk about this. Surely he's not quite at the level to replace Mbappe at PSG. Yeah, I just don't think he's replaceable at this point, is he really, um, at all? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, maybe they bring, him, maybe they would bring him in to bolster that forward line, but um, but yeah, that I I think losing Mbappe, it's more a case of rejigging the forward line to to suit you know to suit say Neymar and Messi more, putting Messi in the centre and getting a another right sided player. I think that would be a better shout for them in the short term at least. Um, I do like Richarlison to be honest. Like I know he's been inconsistent, um, but I do think Everton have generally been a better team with him on the pitch. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think he would be. I think he has the potential for for a club like PSG. But um, but to bring him in as like a like for like replacement for someone like Mbappe is is kind of mad. Um, on on the Nunez thing, I think in some ways Atleti do have a bit of a problem in in. What they would, what they do to replace Suarez, because I kind of feel like Joao Felix, kind of is, you know, is that kind of guy. Like he's got, I think technically he's a more impressive player than Nunez, um, and I think is probably slightly more similar to Suarez earlier in his career at least. Whereas I feel like Nunez is is perhaps the more kind of prolific goal scorer that we've we've come to know Suarez as since his kind of mid twenties. So uh, yeah, I kind of feel like it's it's more a case of how Simeone evolves that Atletico side rather than like one player that they bring in who's going to sort it all out mm. unless, unless they are unless they just bring in someone who can do 20 plus goals in the top 5 league and has has that track record of course it's all going to be tied in with Simeone as well I mean if they don't finish in the top four this year, which is still a possibility, they've got a big game this weekend as we're sure coming up to on big match predictions. You know, maybe Simeone will decide he's taken Atleti as far as he can. Maybe the club will look to go in a different direction. Who knows? Final one is Karamada Yemi going to replace uh, Erling Haaland at Dortmund. Uh, this was suggested by LFC Skies in 96. We had this on transfer preview before Christmas when we were talking with Sky Germany's Max Bielefeld. He said that Dortmund are really, really keen on this deal. I wouldn't be surprised if this one was done in the next couple of months. I don't think Dortmund's idea is that he comes in to replace Haaland. The idea is for him to come in and Haaland to stay, but it, it's very handy to get a striker in before a big name potentially departs anyway. 
I think they'd need to get another striker in because I, I really don't think they'd be able to challenge Bayern Munich with Adeyemi, Makoku, Daniel Marlin and an ageing Marco Royce as their main sort of sources of goals. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a worry for Dortmund, to be honest, even though I do rate Adeyemi very highly. But guys, superstar replacements. What do you guys think? Who do you want to replace... Suarez, Lewandowski, who else do we do? Modric, Salah, KDB, all of the names we've mentioned. Get them in the comments down below and let's move on to big match predictions. Before we get stuck into big match predictions, just a reminder of the scoreboard as it stands. Myself and Henry are tied at the top on 22 points. McCubbs has a little bit of work to do. He's on 11, but there is plenty of time to turn it around. But get your chops around these games we have this weekend. Absolutely massive. First one, Barcelona versus Atletico Madrid. This is taking place at 3.15pm on Sunday. It's fifth versus fourth. One point between them. McCubbs, your beloved Barcelona. I don't know how beloved they are to you, actually. Your, your, your close allegiance with Barcelona. You, are you excited about this weekend against Atleti? New signings coming in the door for Barca. New dawn under Xavi, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, I like, I like, to, I like to give a, put a, give a kind of professional distance between myself and, and them on, on <laughs> football daily stuff um yeah i'm really excited for it um especially the kind of new forward line i don't know whether abameyang traore and Ferran torres will all be starting but it will certainly be interesting to see um you know yeah if, if abameyang or, or traore starts what you know how they how they fit into javi's system both players who i think you know you know there are question marks actually over over both of them and how how they'll how they'll play within within this Barca side because um, yeah this is still a work very much a work in progress isn't it you know their goals per game of you know it's, st it's still fairly poor this season only 1.5 they're scoring per game um, they still rank seventh for goals scored overall and this is you know over two months now into Xavi's tenure so yeah we're, we're coming to the point now where we're kind of really seeing how his team is playing and the, kind of the results of, of of how they're playing so um, despite I think generally performances being pretty good under him um, and quite exciting in terms of the attack like we're still yet to see them really get back to where we've seen them at their best you know in the days before before Messi left so um, so yeah I think there is a bit of a pressure on, on these players to perform Depay is obviously their, their top scorer in the league no one else has scored more than three um, obviously it looked like he was potentially going to leave the club in January but that didn't happen in the end so um, so yeah there, there's a really interesting quite stacked forward line there and it'll be interesting to see yeah to see how it how it lines up um, they do have quite a lot of injuries of course um, TT's out Sergio Roberto's out Ansu Fati is obviously out um, Eric Garcia too Memphis are doubt for this game as well so um, so yeah I don't know I, I think this is really hard to call I feel like when, when there hasn't been that much football on over the last couple of weeks it's kind of hard to it, yeah, especially after like the, the transfers and everything, I think it's yeah it's mm. quite hard to to predict what what kind of performance we're going to see from them. Okay, okay, yeah, I I know what you mean. It's sort of we've lost a little bit of rhythm in the season. I find it quite difficult to get back into club football when it's been away for a little bit. No, I, as in not in terms of passion, <laughs> but I know what you mean in terms mm. of predictions. Henry, Atletico Madrid, quiet window by their by their accounts, but they have recovered slightly from that December misery. December, let's say. Yeah, interesting window. I, I agree. I think we all agree that Rinaldo from Lille is a pretty smart transfer. About yeah. 3, million, 3 million euros. And Daniel Vass coming in from Valencia. That's an interesting one for 2 million. Uh, I think that's just getting bodies in really on that on that front. So uh, maybe maybe saving up to, for a big shift in the summer because as we've just mentioned, they are going to have to over, overhaul a few areas of the squad very soon I mean just the, the, I think the one stat which is just really telling this term is 26 goals conceded already that's the ninth best in the Liga they haven't conceded more than 30 in a completed campaign since 2012-13 which just shows that kind of doggedness about Atletico has perhaps been missing this term and we, we, we've seen them struggle as you said four defeats in a row December I think that was the worst ever under Simeone um, since mm. his time at Atletico two wins and a draw since uh, they came back from 2-0 down to beat Valencia but did also concede two at Villarreal. So, yeah, I mean, you never. Who knows what we're going to see in this game? I'm actually, I'm actually backing Barcelona. I've got, I've got a hunch that Barca are going to. This is it. This is the, this is the rising sun of their, uh, their, their new revolution. I'm going to go for a one 0 <laughs> win for Barcelona. I can just see them sneaking a, a victory in oh, this I one. Um, 
<laughs> is this is this a, is this a Dharma getting the goal? Hey? Listen, I as I said this the other day, I actually think I don't dislike Adama Traore's transfer to Barcelona at all. All it takes is for him to be around some in a more attacking system, to be around some quality finishes, and his stats will suddenly look a lot better than they did at Wolves. I'm not suggesting that it was it, he's not entirely to blame, but he does have an unbelievably unique skill set which is going to come to the fore. The thing I find funny is that they, they went back to La Masia, brought in all these young players, and now I don't know where they're all going to play anymore. So now they've sort of mm-hmm. stacked the line with... They basically did everything they said they weren't going to do and buy loads of old forwards in again. So, listen, let's wait and see. But I'm backing Atleti to lose <laughs> to this Barcelona so you're side. Going, 1-0. You're going 1-0, 1-0 Barcelona. I'm going to go... Um, I'm going to go 1-1. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm always tempted to back Atleti, but no, I'm just going to go 1-1. Um, these these games have been relatively tight. Um, Atleti are actually unbeaten in their last five meetings, uh, winning three of those, including a 2-0 win at the Wanda Metropolitano earlier this season. But prior to that, hadn't beat the, beaten them in nine attempts. So the form in this one, the results in this one, have completely swayed in Atleti's favour. So I'm going for 1-1. McCubbs, what are you thinking? Um... Yeah, I'm going to go for... I might go the same as you do, because actually I think I'm going to go 1-1. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. That's it. Piggyback on the success of the 22s, my That's exactly. what, That's how you get up the table. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the second game, guys. It doesn't slow down in terms of big matches. Bayern Munich versus Leipzig, Saturday 5.30pm. First versus six, separated by a massive 18 points. Wow. Henry, what are your thoughts on this one? I'll keep it short and sweet. I think Bayern Munich are going to win 3-1. On this occasion, um, okay. I, I just they've they've had a knack of just sort of turning up in even the, the bigger matches this season, um, perhaps sort of dragging their heels against some of the, the lesser opposition so far. They're obviously it's not perhaps prolific as we've seen them in yesterday year. They still scored sixty five goals at seven more than the next best in Europe's Liverpool, and ten sides but ten sides have conceded fewer. Uh, yeah, I, I think don't get me wrong. I think Tedesco has done a good job. Leipzig shored them up a little bit, but I still think. They're going to be opened up by this Bayern side. So I'm going to give him 3-1. 3-1. I mean, McCubbs, if Leipzig are going to stand any chance of a win here, they need their main man this season, Christopher Nkunku, to continue his exceptional fall. Yeah, absolutely. What's it? Nine goals and seven assists in 20 league games. Um, another eight gold <laughs> contributions in the Champions League. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of goal scoring form, he really has a hit a new level this term, hasn't he? Um I think he's been one of their best players for the last three years, but but this season, yeah, in front of goal, he's really, yeah, he's really compensated for what was a really poor start to the season from them, wasn't it? Uh, so yeah, I weirdly enough, I actually this is the one uh, game where I made a prediction in my head before, and it was actually three one as well. But uh, I don't know whether to change it just to try and have a bit of variation. Do, I could, do whatever you want. I, could, I, I, might, I might I might keep it as three one, you know, because um, I was just looking at. I mean, <laughs> Leipzig have yeah improved a lot under Tedesco and I think you know we were all quite excited by the appointment when he came in particularly the fact that he's more tactically versatile than than Jesse Marsh was um and I was reading an article really good article by Jasmine Baba who I think is one of the kind of leading kind of English voices on the Bundesliga um and she was saying how you know one of the big changes has been the fact that he's reverted them back to a zonal marking system whereas Jesse Marsh was trying to do kind of man to man and yeah, the kind of zonal marking system was very much, you know, what they were used to under Nagelsmann. Um, just yeah, there's there's a number of kind of changes tactically that Tedesco has made that has just yeah just made this team a lot more of a comfortable operation. Um, and obviously, Andre Silva as well has been, you know, has been kind of reborn under him so far too. So so yeah, I think Leipzig, you know, they're what only two points or two or three points off um, the top four now. Mm, and it's pretty it's mad to think, you know, only only a month ago, they were they were around the same kind of kind of uh, around the same kind of points as um, Munch and Gladbach and Wolfsburg, who are both you know looking at you know looking fairly scared down at the relegation zone at the moment. So just goes to show how tight this Bundesliga is, especially in the in the in the middle of, uh, of, of the table. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, I, I still back Bayern. I still back Bayern. I think Leipzig haven't. You know, as good as they've been under Tedesco, they haven't had a big challenge yet. Um, mm. And Barn obviously are the, are the biggest one. They won four one earlier in the campaign. I think Leipzig have only beaten them once in thirteen meetings. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've got to play it safe here and go for a three one Barn victory. 
I'm going to go the same margin, but I'm going to go 2 0. I'm going to go 2 0. I think, yeah, Bayern have the ability, as, as Henry and you both intonated earlier, to just step up for these games when they, when they really need to. Um, there are slight injury concerns for Bayern. Goretzka is out. Alfonso Davies has those heart problems at the moment. So hopefully, you know, we wish him a speedy recovery um, from everyone here at uh, FD Cheaper Moting. Uh, and Bunasar have been at the AFCON as well, so they probably won't be involved, but neither of those are massive losses. But Goretzka and Alfonso Davies, two players that would have started. That might give Leipzig a little bit of hope, but I'm going for a 2-0 Bayern win. Let's move on to the final game, and it's Inter Milan, AC Milan, guys. I told you it was a hell of a weekend across Europe. Saturday, 5pm, first, <laughs> first versus third, sorry, four points between them. My Cubs, do you get the impression that if AC Milan want to win the title... They almost have to win this game? Yeah, probably. They certainly can't lose it. Um, I think Inter are... Yeah, I, I think Inter just have so much more potential to um, go on a big run in the second half of the season. And I think if there's seven points between them, I can't really see Inter giving that up, barring, you know, like an injury crisis or whatnot. And so far, they've, they've gotten away with that. Milan have been far more unlucky with injuries and they have a smaller squad. Um... So yeah, I mean, Inter have just been superb, haven't they? Especially since kind of November time, um, they they've just looked excellent. I think kind of in every area of the pitch, you know, we we've seen really big performances from players. Lautaro Martinez obviously has has taken his goal scoring form to a new level. Edin Dzeko and Shannon Oglu have shown their best Serie A form in years. Um, obviously, the defense has been really solid. The wing backs have been really good, and now they've added. Uh, Robin Gerson's to the to the table as well. Um, you know, in, in almost every metric, they're up there with the best in Europe. I think they, I think maybe only City and Bayern take more shots than or something, or maybe at least the last time I looked at shot numbers, um, that was the case. So yeah, and as an attacking force, Inter have just yeah really stepped up this year under Simone Inzaghi and. And in some ways, yeah, I kind of want them to win the title because I think Simone Inzaghi is it really, really deserves it. Um, after all those years, kind of with with a relatively limited Lazio team getting so much out of them. Um, but yeah, as as for this game, yeah, I think it's must win for Milan. But I, yeah, I just don't think they have it. I think I think Inter are, yeah, Inter are my favourites for this one for sure. Yeah, they'd be mine as well. I think ugh, Milan made a massive error not recruiting a, a centre back in, in January with Kier and, and Tomori out. I mean, they're having to play Kalulu and Romagnoli, I think, in this game as well. Of course, they've got Bendinka and uh, Kessi back from the AFCON, but yeah, not ideal preparation for this game whatsoever. Very quickly, I mean, Henry... I'm, just going to, I'm just going to put my score prediction out there in case one of you Go two on. has the same one, because I'm not going <laughs> to mirror. Uh, I'm just going to say, I don't even know what it is now. Yeah, I'll say two... I'll say 2 1. I'll say 2 1. They're always two, a tight one affair. 2 1 to Inter, I to assume. Inter, yeah. I'm going to go. I think it might be quite comprehensive. I'm going to go 3 0 uh, really? to Inter. Um, yeah, I've just got a feeling. Maybe I'm just. Call me crazy on this Thursday afternoon. But yeah, 3 0 <laughs> Inter for me. Henry, what are you going for? I'll go 2 0 uh, to Inter. So we've, we'll have a nice. No one predicting an upset. The full spread, but yeah, don't worry, McCubs. I was going to throw to you first on that one anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I think in, Inter have just been so impressive this season, and uh, I think a lot of people just got it wrong about them. Um, so yeah, why not? I think they could. I just, I, I, at least, at least AC Milan have got Kessie and Benacer back, as you said. But but at the same time, I just think they're not going to have enough to um, cope against. This inter side. They also got Saicedo in on loan as well, so they've got even more options in attack if they need to figure out a way to unlock uh, the defence. Yeah, I think Ibra's out as well, so it doesn't look too good for Milan. But guys, get your score predictions for those massive games in the comments down below. It's worth noting as well that there's two massive games in Ligue 1 as well. It's Monaco versus Lyon, and on Saturday night, it's uh, that's on Saturday night. Lille versus PSG, I believe, it's taking place wow. on Sunday. But unfortunately, we couldn't preview any more than three games because we have run on and on this episode. Although I hope you guys have enjoyed it, and that's all we've got time for on Continental Club for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Let us know what you guys thought of our replacements for those superstars all across Europe and of course our big match predictions as ever in the comments down below. Henry, if they've enjoyed Continental Club, what should they go and watch now? 
Oh, just quickly, Lil are going to put big fat W over PSG. I'm telling you, oh. it's happening. Yeah. So after, you don't get any bonus points for that, Henry. I know. No bonus after points. Nice beat them in the French Cup, Dante Paneka couldn't oh, believe it. Was so I good. reckon Lil, so Lil is... Lil are going to do it. That's so outrageous from Dante, by the way. At his age, that moment. <laughs> to do it against Donnarumma as well, who's like... Yeah. You know, so so rated as a penalty stopper, like you, just to just to just to bruise his ego a little bit. Did you guys see the um, the clip of the two minute like highlights package of Messi's game versus Nice, and it was played against that really slow flute music? Oh, <laughs> when, it, when when like someone's had a massive stinker, they play it against that flute music, and yeah, it was not pretty from Messi, but yeah, terrible there performance we. from PSG all all round really. Uh, McCubs, anything you'd like to push to? Um. <laughs> Uh, go and check out our explains. We did a really good one on Celtic, I believe, written by yourself, Henry. Was it? No, Celtic? that was me. What was you, Diggs? Nice, nice. Um, yeah, that's a really good video about Celtic and how, um, yeah, how, how they're you know buying all the talent in Japan and how that's working out for them. Worked out pretty well for them the other night, didn't it? So yeah, go and check Definitely out. Definitely did. Yeah, Rio Hatate, what a player, what a guy. Guys, thank you very much for watching Continental Club. Hopefully, we'll be back in the East Dulwich Tavern next week. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Goodbye.